ICD students and chapter. Today we have Ashley Hagerbacker from SDE Company. Uh, Ashley is the project lead for SDE Technologies Innovation, EMARC Initiative. She works to integrate innovative community colleges to SDE's development to significantly reduce carbon emissions. That is one of the key features of the EMARC project. Ashley holds both a bachelor's degree in bioengineering and a master's degree and environmental engineering from Stanford, and she has accumulated a breadth of experience in the field of green technology and intelligent mobility, and Ashley here is to talk to us about uh, the e project in London, Ontario. So without further ado, uh, I'm joining you welcome to Ashley today. So Toka gave a quick introduction to who I am. I work for S2 Technologies. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction to who we are really quickly just to be able to give you some context for the project and what we're planning to do. Um, so S2 Technologies is a sustainable technology and development company. Our whole mission is about being able to act on climate and being able to truly make a difference when it comes to environmental uh, initiatives. So that's kind of the underlying aspect that goes behind all of our projects and you'll be able to kind of hear that throughout the presentation that everything that we do is really focusing on how to be able to incorporate sustainability. Um, so we are based in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, we were founded in 2006 and we started off as a solar farm development uh, company as well as a uh, solar farm manufacturing company. So a lot of our expertise comes from the solar industry, um, understanding how to develop energy solutions and uh, being able to uh, kind of launch a new technology that was taking quite a while to be able to deploy and ending up bringing it to mass market. So our company has four different uh, business units and we're kind of going to be touching on a couple of them. One of them is the development of smart communities, so net zero energy, sustainable communities. The other is energy solutions. So in a lot of our communities, we have different microgrid systems, battery storage, solar systems, as well as our new smart mobility unit, where we're looking at developing and deploying um, innovative autonomous electric vehicle and parking solutions, as well as a pretty robust uh, research and development group. Um, this graph's kind of a little bit challenging to see here, but essentially we've had a bunch of different projects and we started off developing solar farms, like I mentioned beforehand. So we developed two of the largest solar farms in Canada, um, uh, both over 100 megawatts, and developed um, a solar manufacturing facility in Guelph um, that had over a gigawatt of manufacturing capability a year. So it was a pretty uh, innovative project. Um, and then after working through all the kind of energy, energy generation side, we really realized that there was quite a bit of opportunity in the real estate market to be able to incorporate solar technology within homes. So Ontario had the feed and tariff program and we saw that there wasn't a lot of residential pickup of having solar panels on roofs. So we asked ourselves and our colleagues in the development area why that was. Why don't you have um, solar panels on every home considering the incentives at that time were astronomical. You're getting 80 cents per kilowatt hour for generating solar on your homes. Um, so it was actually quite interesting. So we launched our new endeavor uh, in our smart community team. So essentially the idea was how can we develop a community or a neighborhood where you would be able to generate all the electricity that you would use on site um, and essentially develop a net zero energy community. So we would still be tied to the local grid, but you can be able to generate all the electricity on site and you just export it when you're not using it. So what we did is we went around to a bunch of developers around Ontario, knocked on people's doors saying, hey, we really want to be able to do a sustainable uh, development for you guys if you do have any land or any projects that we can work with. And we found one partner down in London, Ontario called Sifton Properties. And they kind of gave us our entry into our first project in this realm called West Five. So what we did is we suggested doing a feasibility study to figure out what the ultimate sustainable community would be like. Um, and so one of the interesting and most exciting parts of our company is that we ended up getting over 100 graduate students from 11 different universities to come together for four months. And we challenge everyone, the professors' teams, the graduate students' teams, to think about 
what the ultimate sustainable community would look like, thinking about water systems, energy systems, transportation systems, what types of incentives you need, and what behavioral aspects you have to think about. Um, and from this study, um, with all the different marketing components and everything, uh, it led to our community, West Five. So that community is in London right now. Um, the plan is for it to have over 2,000 residential units, ranging from apartments, retirement homes, townhomes, um, and over 400,000 square feet of commercial retail, uh, commercial space. So that's office buildings, retail, and all those different elements. And we are planning an entire DC microgrid there to serve, uh, to connect the, the solar, um, the battery storage, and all the different elements. And later on, we'll be able to kind of, the reason why I'm mentioning West Five now is because the project that I'm working on, Eve, is actually within this West Five community. Um, so right now, it's actually uh, under construction. Some of it's already built. The office buildings, uh, two of the office buildings are there. We're starting construction on the apartment building. Um, and we are uh, developing uh, uh, several of the townhomes are already there, and we're continuing to develop on this property. The next component that's really important to be able to give a bit of an introduction to the e Park project is that we've recently deployed our smart mobility group. Um, so in this group, we are researching a couple of different areas. One of them is electric vehicle charging and uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. The other is autonomous uh, technologies and infrastructure that you need for that, as well as some new parking solutions. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of where our expertise and background is, um, and that can lead us into the project that was mentioned today. Yeah. Sorry, actually, I still have a clarifying question. Yes. Um, so in that development, what is your company's role? So or we're the Are you technolo- building the, the buildings or? Yeah, so we are the technology partner. So we essentially help advise on all the different technological components that were in there. And then now actually we have the option to, uh, we are um, building a part of that project. So we are the developer there. So we're putting in the money and the uh, doing uh, managing the construction for this particular development at Eve Park. And so, We've had a kind of hands-on partnership with the developer and all the meetings to be able to establish all the sustainability sustainability elements. Um, but now we're actually uh, acting as a developer in the project as well and uh, building the buildings. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so kind of going back into the E Park project. So on the northwest corner of that West Five project, we are developing this new type of development where. We saw that there was a lot of opportunity to bring sustainability on the building side. You can make them net zero energy, you just have to make them more uh, better insulation, better uh, energy efficient technologies. Um, but we kind of figured out the kind of formula for that and we decided to really enter into the sustainable transportation realm and really tackle those emissions. Um, so this kind of brought us to our new project called Eve Park. Um, the concept is trying to Reimagine a community where autonomous vehicles are the norm and you have electric vehicles for everyone in the community. So, reimagining a community without uh, the need for garages, road, uh, a lot of roads, driveways, all the things that you think of in a typical townhome, row neighborhood. Um, so, this community is also net zero energy. So, they and the concept is that all of the residents would be served by all electric autonomous car share fleet. So, essentially, what the residents would be able to do is summon a car to their doorstep uh, from the parking area, and it would pick them up, drive them up to the edge of the property, and then they would be able to assume control of the vehicle. Similarly, when they come home, they would enter the property, it would assume autonomous. Uh, driving capabilities, drop them off, and then it would go park itself. So it's only autonomous within that particular area on the private roads, but it allows you to be able to test some very low speed autonomous capabilities, as well as being able to understand what the design elements would be in a neighborhood where you would have these autonomous capabilities. So that's kind of a rendering showing of what the community looks like. So there are four different clusters, that's kind of what these circly swoopy things we're calling. Um, which have on average between 13 and 17 units per cluster. So each of these different kind of cross sections of pie pieces are units. Um, and it's a for sale property that we're developing. And so it has a bunch of different technological components. 
One of them is the electric vehicle aspect, so providing high density electric vehicle charging. We're also um, developing, deploying, and I'll show you a little bit later, these automatic parking towers, which are almost like Ferris wheels for cars, where the cars would be parked. So after dropping someone off, they would just go into these parking towers to be parked and charged. Um, and then once they get off the property, they can drive off and it would be uh, back down to level two driving capabilities. Um, so a little bit more about the buildings, they're all net zero energy. We've been pretty lucky about being awarded a couple of grants um, to be able to test some different microgrid technologies. I mean, we've been working closely with London Hydro, uh, the local utility in London, to be able to test different um, microgrid solutions there. Um, and there's quite a bit of different innovative technologies that we're incorporating into these. Um, so this is the planned community, and we're hoping to start construction uh, by the uh, fall of this year to be able to launch this project. Um, the next aspect is, again, this is a sustainable transportation aspect. So we're looking at a couple of different potential models. Ideally, we would essentially have this all be a car share fleet. For everyone who comes to live here, they would gain the access to be able to use an electric vehicle as part of the car share program. Um, we're looking at a couple of different models, and I'll talk to this a little bit later, but we've been doing actually quite a bit of marketing research to see what people in London are willing to do. Um, how much car sharing are they actually willing to participate in? Because it's um, not common in suburban areas to necessarily look, at, and this is kind of in a suburban area of London, but we're trying to um, tackle some of the issues associated with that. Um, and so we are trying to figure out what the best model for car sharing is. So there could be a possibility that we would allow for some full ownership of one of the electric vehicles where we would potentially buy back one of their uh, their normal car and then we'd provide them with either a lease or a, allow them to own the vehicle and then there would be a certain number of cars that would be shared or ideally, and what we're targeting for is to have them all be for car share, uh, car pooling. Um, and here we're also having, I guess I mentioned the autonomous vehicle and electric vehicle charging pilot stuff. Um, we have a pretty interesting network um, that's been developed for this project. I'm hoping to work with uh, some of uh, the teams at the University of Toronto looking at some of the different elements as well. Um, but we have uh, worked with a couple of really interesting architects that really have designed some of the interesting designs that you probably haven't seen normally in a suburban neighborhood in London. Um, so that's Dora and Gensler as well as a group of other uh, organizations that have been really instrumental in developing this project. So there were three different elements, before I kind of get into the details, that we're really targeting in the technology development aspect of this project. There's to be able to make a truly sustainable transportation option. I'm sure you guys have looked into this. You really have to have a combination of um, low carbon vehicles. So here we're using electric vehicles. Having the autonomous vehicles really can potentially, if done properly, can lead to lower emission scenarios because you're essentially reducing some of the trip nested needs that you would uh, need later, as well as um, the shared concept. So the shared aspect of sharing all the cars really can be able to make a drastic impact sustainability-wise because you're not having single occupancy vehicles around or you're not necessarily having vehicles sitting around for as a common, the common statistic that's used, like 95% of the time your vehicle's sitting standing. And, um, and so these are all ways to be able to tackle the sustainable element of uh, transportation by having those three different pillars that we're addressing in this project. Um, so the first one is the high density electric vehicle charging that we're looking into in this project. Um, it's cut up a little bit, but essentially, um, one of the challenges that our company has come across, and we've had a bunch of people talk to us about from different communities and different companies, where there aren't a ton of electric vehicle charging solutions for lots of cars in dense areas. If you hear Uber or Lyft talk about why they haven't really deployed a ton of electric vehicles, they're most commonly saying there's not a lot of really good charging areas in cities, so our drivers don't want to be able to use an electric vehicle because it's going to take them forever to find charging. So we have been investing some time in figuring out how to be able to deploy these high density electric vehicle charging units that would potentially be able to be deployed in multiple, in very dense urban areas. So think of a gas station, if you could have like essentially instead of 
uh, having a bunch of fuel pumps, you have an electric vehicle charging tower where you plug in the car and it would get charged and you'd be able to have, in certain scenarios, in this car carousel parking tower, you can have the, up to 16 stalls. So these dimensions of these is like five meters by uh, seven meters, I think. And it's, it's uh, about the area of two parking spots and you can be able to have up to 16 cars there. So it increases the ratio of uh, the parking spot. Uh, you can get up to eight cars for one parking spot. So two parking spots, 16 cars, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, and in this pilot, we're hoping to test a bunch of different electric vehicle charging technologies. So we'll have just typical level two chargers um, where we're gonna try and optimize the system so you'd actually have one charging bank with multiple connections to the cars. So that's one of the high costs putting in the transformer and actually putting in the charging technology, but if you have just the conduits being uh, attached to these carousel parking towers, it can actually reduce costs significantly, hopefully. Um, we're also hoping to deploy a level three charger, which it'll be interesting once we move into the community to see what the usage will actually be of the cars, because um, to understand whether that's actually necessary, because in most residential scenarios, you really don't need that. But if you're in that Uber or Lyft scenario where you have a gas station that essentially that is, these are being plopped down on, then you would need to have that level three charging capabilities, especially if they're driving um, and they're on shift, essentially. Um, we're looking at a couple other technologies, um, a wireless charging technology. We are um, working with a company out of Vancouver that's um, developing these magnetic resonance wireless chargers. So you've probably seen a couple of like inductive chargers, but their technology is slightly different. Um, and they're very exciting and interesting. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about their technology that we're excited about is that they're compatible with multiple different types of vehicles. So if they work for autonomous, the same unit works for an autonomous shuttle as for a passenger vehicle, um, which is kind of interesting, especially if you're gonna have different modalities in the community. Um, as well as we're hoping to have, and we have uh, funding to be able to do a vehicle to grid charging uh, pilot, where we'd essentially be able to modify some of the cars to be able to have bi-directional charging capabilities. And we're going to be testing the different functionalities that, that would be useful for. So whether we have it for um, ancillary services or just for storage abilities, um, we're working with London Hydro to be able to figure out what the best use of that is. Um, so there are a lot of different charging elements that we're looking at this project, um, as well as there's quite a bit of actual logistics that go behind it too, like managing the charging uh, software, making sure that it's meeting the demands, potentially having some predictive analytics in there to predict once everyone moves in, understand when the charging is actually necessary. You can program it beforehand, you can be able to take advantage of uh, people's schedules and understand what is actually needed. You see on weekends people are taking long trips, so you need to be able to have fully charged vehicles, um, so it's interesting as well as developing the mobile app interface to be able to see how what the charge level of the vehicles are. Um, there are quite a bit of other areas of academic inquiry that are here. So one of the things that we're trying to figure out beforehand and been doing a lot of um, marketing research for um, is understanding how people are going to be using the vehicles. The census has, uh, Stat Canada has uh, quite a bit of um, data on generally what commute times are in London and how far they're going, but you can only use that to some degree because you don't really know who those people are until they actually buy units. So that's going to be really interesting to be able to plug in to our uh, charging information. Um, it'll also be interesting to see which charging technologies work best in the community. We kind of think that the level two chargers should be more than sufficient, but it'll be interesting since we're going to have a lot of different aspects in there. Um, the charging management system is going to be interesting, as well as understanding what the charging needs are for the uh, car sharing aspect. And then later on, we're also thinking of potentially having some of these vehicles be able to be rented out for ride sharing gate drivers. So essentially, if you want to be able to use a car on the off times, we've done some research on this actually, the ride sharing times tend to be a little bit different than when people are actually using their cars. Um, and so that might be an interesting way to be able to uh, boost usership of these cars by renting them out to uh, gig drivers. So there are a couple of interesting areas um, for research there. Um, the next aspect is we're looking at deploying these autonomous vehicles, which is one of the things that we, uh, we were actually talking about this a little bit earlier, we kind of 
underestimated how challenging it would be, but we've developed some pretty interesting partnerships to be able to figure out what exactly the opportunity is in a small residential community. So one of our ideas here was for the autonomous vehicles, if we could, instead of having all the autonomous technology be on the cars and on onboard units, how can you be able to take advantage of them only operating in this residential neighborhood and being able to create a robust system, uh, infrastructure-based system that would supplement the cars? So our hypothesis was, if you have the same cars in the same neighborhood that is being monitored by these infrastructure sensing systems, technically, you should be able to have a decent vehicle to infrastructure tech, uh, communication to be allow for um, not all of the sensing and computing it, uh, uh, aspects being on the cars themselves. So the idea is if you're having the infrastructure constantly monitoring the area instead of having a car that's typically in autonomous technologies right now, whenever it goes into a new area, it's kind of new to them, uh, the car, so they have to evaluate every single aspect of the of the community again. And if you have the infrastructure having a constant feed on the cars, it could be able to communicate uh, based on the patterns that it's observed. So if the camera on the infrastructure, like the light post is seeing that this area 24 seven, ideally you'd be able to communicate to the cars, okay, well, there's nothing here beforehand and they would be able to know before they actually get to that area. So our idea is to be able to really rely on some of the infrastructure based um, so there are five different components that we're really looking at here, um, and I'm going to show a diagram that's going to be almost impossible to see, but I'll kind of go into each of the different steps later. But this is kind of just a brief schematic of kind of what we're thinking of for this autonomous vehicle aspect. There are five main prongs that we're analyzing um, between the um, path planning, the vehicle, the infrastructure, the logistics information system, and the central uh, computing system that will be monitoring all of this. Um, so the first thing, uh, on the vehicles, obviously you need to be able to have some sensing and uh, control technology on the vehicles themselves. Um, otherwise, you're not going to really be able to achieve uh, a, a uh, robust enough autonomous level because you do need to be able to have that, um, that ability to process potential obstacle if it kind of jumps out of nowhere in case there's some latency issue or something with the infrastructure. So there'll be some min uh, minimal sensing uh, infrastructure on the cars themselves. Um, and there are a lot of different components that will have to be added onto these vehicles. So we're hoping to partner with a couple of different OEM companies. We're already going to partner with one, but we're hoping to kind of test a couple di different vehicles um, to be able to make sure that um, that we have a robust enough system and that we can draw some interesting conclusions from it. Um, and so from a company point viewpoint, there's a lot of different elements that we really have to be working on the vehicles. We have to work on calibrating all the sensors on the vehicles with the infrastructure uh, sensing uh, data and being able to uh, make sure that this system is robust enough within our community, uh, within our system. Um, as well as really figuring out all the different inputs that will need to be processed by the vehicle for the VDX communication system. Um, the next, next aspect that we're really trying to have to figure out is all the infrastructure components. So what can we put on the infrastructure? What should we put on the infrastructure to be able to communicate with the cars? So we'll be having different LiDAR systems and sensing aspects on different elements of the community. So there are like areas, light posts, areas that we'll be putting them on or potentially on the buildings themselves as well, um, where we would have all the different sensing technologies as well as an area for the actual processing of the uh, elements. Um, the next section, which is kind of the really interesting aspect is Somehow we need to be able to coordinate all of these different components in the community in a very uh, secure and robust way, um, which is going to be, I, we think, one of the most challenging aspects um, because we're going to have to have a good enough mobile user interface to be able to summon the card. That's going to have to communicate with the central computing system, which will have to communicate with the parking towers which will have to talk to the chargers to tell them how much to charge for, which will have to communicate with the infrastructure system. So there's a, quite a bit of logistics that actually has to go into here. 
So there are a lot of different elements that we'll be having to go into these, and there'll be multiple different controlling systems that they'll have to communicate with to make sure that this all works seamlessly. So we're hoping to deploy this project uh, early, uh, next year and actually have everyone, when everyone moves into these units. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting to see what the minimally viable working product will be and then what we can add on to it afterwards. So we'll be doing quite a bit of testing and preparation for that. Um, the next imp uh, aspect that we're really looking at is the perception path tracking and planning aspect. So we're going to have to have different uh, tracking systems that will be on the infrastructure, but also um, having like inertial measurement units on the cars to be able to just show where their, pos their position is and being able to um, uh, communicate accurately where these cars are, because that's going to be one of the most crucial aspects, especially if we're trying to do um, obstacle aversion, like you really need to be able to have an exact positioning of the cars. But that's one of the benefits of our project is because it's a small little test area that we're hopefully going to be able to have quite a bit of systems in place um, to be able to do this testing. Um, and we find it actually a pretty interesting area because it is a higher risk pedestrian area because it's a, some people's neighborhood. So you don't want your kids or your pets or anything to be harmed. So it's going to be a real living uh, test area, as well as it's in Canada, so we have all the different weather elements that a lot of these testing groups out in California don't necessarily have, all the snow and wind and uh, precipitation elements that will be included. Um, and then the last component is really that central monitoring and control system. So instead of having all the computing power necessary on the vehicles themselves, hopefully we'd be able to extract some of that and put that in the infrastructure. So we'll have a control, central like infrastructure-based controller unit, and then for each of the cars, they'll have some processing abilities. But figuring out that breakdown has been really interesting and will continue to be very interesting because you have to be able to have a balance between what's on the cars and what's actually on the infrastructure and make sure that there are a lot of fail-safes um, in case something goes wrong on one of them, you can still have a safe environment to live in because this is ultimately people's homes that we're around. Um, so there's quite a bit of elements there. Um, again, an interesting logistics aspect. The other really interesting thing about this project is that it's all um, going to be within, uh, you're, we're developing all this infrastructure technology. And right now, the concept is for these passenger vehicles to be the ones that are using this. But there are a couple of other elements that we really want to be able to integrate in this. Um, one of them are um, autonomous utility vehicles as well. Because I don't in the original renderings, you saw it's, there's not like a ton of space inside to be able to navigate a big snow plow or like, uh, to be able to do a lot of landscaping for the urban agricultural concepts. So we're hoping to like deploy little autonomous not too little, but autonomous utility vehicles that could potentially use snow plowing, uh, landscaping, waste removal, so like picking out compost bins or um, recycling or trash, uh, hopefully not too much trash, um, uh, aspects um, from, the, uh, from the units. And so that's another thing that might be able to use this infrastructure, as well as this is all within the greater West Five community that had all those different units and all those different um, uh, residents and people working there, so we're hoping also eventually to be able to deploy an autonomous shuttle system, and so a lot of this, maybe that would be, this infrastructure would be able to communicate with that shuttle system and be used for other things than just these passenger vehicles. So, like you can see, like, if we wanted to, like, have a small autonomous delivery vehicle, or I don't know if you guys have seen the different mining vehicles that are autonomous now, something like that, but instead for landscaping and uh, snow removal. Um, so just briefly, there's again, we're working with a couple of different university teams and hopefully um, engaging with some of you um, on some of the technological components for the autonomous capabilities. Um, but there's quite a few other aspects that really need to be explored here. Understanding how people interact with these autonomous vehicles, especially in a residential neighborhood, will be really interesting. And understanding how to communicate with the individual. So like cars coming by, do you have a flashing red light? Do people respond to that flash, flashing red light? If after the 100th time, are they still uh, responding to that flashing red light saying a car's coming? Or are they kind of already figuring out, well, I can probably make it before that and come up with a safety issue? Um, and so there's a lot of different elements that, because this is something that is relatively new, that we're going to be having to explore 
that behavioral aspect of the autonomous vehicles. Um, there are a lot of safety concerns. We're working, it's one of our priorities is figuring out the security of the cars and the cybersecurity elements, and we're working uh, with a couple industry partners as well as um, Western to be able to look into um, the cybersecurity elements. Um, but that's uh, a huge priority and also one of the biggest risk factors besides um, uh, besides the safety element as well. So there's a lot of different elements that have to be looked into there, especially to make sure that if any, going through every single scenario, essentially of what could possibly go wrong before being able to plan some type of system to prevent that. Um, and there are various different technological components that we I outlined there that still need to be investigated, but there's a lot more as well that um, need to be investigated a little more. Um, and finally, uh, the shared vehicles concept. So I mentioned beforehand that this is hopefully going to be a car sharing program for all the residents, but we're also looking at a couple of different other models of carpooling. So if both people are going to work at Western, um, then uh, can we be able, like two people in the neighborhood are going to work at Western, how can we get them to carpool together? What incentives do we offer? How do we be able to price this properly and, um, and uh, design it properly to be able to incentivize uh, higher occupancy vehicles? Um, there's also the ride sharing component that I was mentioning. So at what stage are we ready to be able to offer these vehicles to gig drivers? Um, and those different elements one of the really interesting aspects that we've really been focusing on is how to be able to measure all the different environmental benefits or issues with having these different types of models and systems of like uh, the car sharing. So how can you be, what's the ideal, most realistic way to be able to get people to carpool and car share? What are the emissions effects of that? Um, and understanding as well, once people are there, what all the different patterns are going to be. We've been working quite a bit with um, some groups that are actually study on the, the car share usership patterns and have given us some ideas for urban areas, but this is not like a in the middle of Toronto area. This is in London, which doesn't really have the same traffic patterns and the same usage that you'd find in cities where most of this data is coming from. So if you look at a lot of the car sharing usage data that comes from different academic papers, or they're not really focusing so much on these suburban areas, which will be a little bit different. So we really need to be able to figure out um, how to how to manage that, um, and then understanding uh, really interesting different incentive models and uh, being able to integrate it in the actual mobile interface to make it as robust and easy as possible. Um, so there are quite a few elements to this project. It's not. A, it's something that will, as I mentioned a little bit before, happen in phases. So we'll integrate a, a working product to start, but we'll be definitely doing quite a few iterations. And it's not going to be open day one with a completely working system. And as I know, a lot of you know, there's a lot of kicks to be worked out with the autonomous vehicle aspect, with the electric vehicle charging aspect. There's a lot of it will work right away, but with some of the different elements and integrating it all together, it will. It will be a challenge. Um, so that's kind of an outline of Eve Park project. Um, and now, if you have any questions, I can um, answer those. Two questions. I'll ask the simplest one first. Um, in terms of the overall logistics control, have you looked at the Blackboard model? Or are you aware of the Blackboard model? No. Um, anyway, we can take that offline. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, the second question is, uh, have you run into any of the problems that Keyside, Sidewalk Labs, Toronto Waterfront has run into regarding data, security, privacy, all that type of stuff? Or have you successfully been under the radar of everybody? I was just talking about this with a couple of your colleagues just, a couple bit, uh, just right before the seminar. Um, so we're lucky that nobody knows S2 technologies as much as they know Google. <laughs> um, so when you mention our company, I don't think anybody's like, oh, those data people as much as Google. Um, but it is going to be a major concern once we start solving these. So, like we want to make sure that we address all the issues and show people that we're not uh, not going to be using their data to be able to like, sell ads or something like that. Um, so we haven't run across those, but I can assume that that will be an issue that will come up, especially. So you haven't put in place policies yet. You're going to wait and see what not to do based on sidewalk labs. Well, we'll see what ends up going up first, because I mean, we're going to be building this 
uh, this coming year. So I mean, it'll be interesting. We're we're um, we're we're very aware of what's happening at Sidewalk Labs and actually been participating to some degree in some of their development stuff. So it's um it's interesting. We we are of the benefit that we're not as uh, notable as Google, and so we don't necessarily come with all the baggage that we necessarily come with um, with the data aspect. But it's you know, we're. We'll definitely be learning from our peers on that. One last quick question, sorry. Um, are you aware of Second Capital in China? China, no. Okay, so Second, second Capital is a building of a uh, Second Capital for China near Beijing, it's about 100 kilometers away. They have basically built uh, what Sidewalk, Sidewalk Labs is proposing. Really? Uh, but it's actually operational. Um, and so they are facing or trying to do many of the things that Sidewalks is trying to do with what you're trying to do, and you may want to just take a look at it to see what technologies, et cetera, they use. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, the whole idea behind this is that there are so many different aspects of this that have already kind of been deployed to, to some degree. So we're in very much in a learning stage as well to be able to establish what's been done, what can we learn, and what's different in our area. Um, but that's really interesting. I'll definitely take a look. It's, 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 it's actually called Second Capital, or well, that's like your point known as the Second thing. Capital? It's known as the Second Capital. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have a quick question about the um, technology companies. Um, have you considered any um, business, uh, technology companies in, uh, in terms of uh, interacting with um, disabled, uh, disabled pedestrians, such as um, blind pedestrian, or any sort of uh, disability in terms of interacting with this announcement? That is something that we haven't developed any. We haven't developed official relationships with anybody yet on the actual accessibility aspects. But that's one of the things that has come up. We ran a marketing campaign where we had these. Um, we essentially reached out to a bunch of Londoners to be able to get information about what they wanted in the community, what they reacted to in the renderings and stuff. And one of the things that came up actually quite a bit was accessibility. Like uh, it was actually quite interesting. And so we. Given that this is an interesting platform for people to test different things, we don't necessarily want to lock out anybody. We want to make it as inclusive as possible. And so um, it's one of the things that actually has been on our radar quite a bit. But if you have any recommendations for specific companies that we should be reaching out to, we'd definitely be more than interested on that. But it's one of our priorities for sure. Just out of, I mean, obviously we want to be able to be accessible, but that was one of the pieces of feedback that we got, um, which was really interesting. So in terms of routing, uh, I do trust that distributed routing systems uh, have proven their robustness compared to centralized routing systems, mm -hmm. especially that you are utilizing intelligent vehicles with, let's say, electric vehicles. Like these two types, it could be a good idea to consider a distributed routing system. Distributed routing system? Distributed routing system. Yeah, yeah distributed. Yeah, um, yeah I, it'll be interesting. So we're that's one of the things that um, our, uh, one of our uh, partners is specifically looking at is that the actual path tracking and path planning aspects. Yes. Um, but it'll, th we'll have to see what ends up working in the, some of the prototypes. So we're actually going to do an intermediate test potentially on, in Waterloo just to be able to figure out how things work uh, properly. But I think we'll be testing multiple different mechanisms just because we're going to be in an autonomous driving laboratory setting. Yeah. But um, it will be interesting and we'll see what ends up working the best, but I think that in this particular neighborhood, there might be some opportunities to be able to test a variety of different protocols or okay. systems. Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, as for you, are you supposing that people who live in this F park, if they are, if they have destinations out of the boundary, how are they supposed to commute? Do they reach the boundary and then they take public? Uh, they reach the boundary and then the autonomous systems are disabled. And so then they can be able to drive it off the system. So essentially, it's only autonomous for like the valley okay. parking system. Okay. Um, so sorry, I I usually breeze over that because I understand it pretty well. But I'm sorry for not. No, no, it's okay. I just want to understand the logic of the whole. Yeah. Thing. So essentially, you're drive like you're in the car. The car like autonomously. So it's really actually a pretty simple autonomous function. Yeah. That was the whole idea because it's challenging <laughs> to be able to get like full autonomous to be able to work in London in general. Absolutely. Um, but once we get to the end of the property we're and that's another logistics component but we are sure that it's possible turn off the autonomous capabilities and then it would get back to convention like 
human drive vehicle. Yeah, exactly. It would have some of the functionalities of like telling you when you're going out of your lane or something, yes. or like bearing out if you're trying to change lanes, somebody's next to you, like stuff like that, but not um, nothing like actual autonomous function. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, you brought up that 95% statistic about how, and so a lot of times people think that the problem there is everybody wants the car at the same 5% of the time, yeah. not that it's, they're not being used 50% or 60% of the time. Right. So it's important to understand the problem in that context because a lot of the, everybody's going to want one to go to work in the morning and then how's that going to work? So there's a, there's a, like yeah. there's a building near me where they, they built an underground parking garage and they have an elevator to bring the cars up. And everybody that's living in there is freaking out because it takes them 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get out of the garage in the morning because there's so many cars using the elevator. Yeah. So it's important, really important to understand that context that the 5% is the problem, not the 95%. The other thing I noticed about this is like all the reasons you do this are because you're in a tight, urban, expensive setting like downtown Toronto where, you know, spaces type, but you're having to do it in a suburban context where you have none of the advantages of that from, from economic points of view. So it's it's kind of a very difficult thing you've chosen to do. Yeah. Like, like no, I mean, it just, it's like trying to put something that just, uh, from the moon onto the earth or vice versa. It just like it works so much better if it was in an urban context, all this stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. I, the one benefit that we do have is that there's so many other elements within the West 5 community that we're taking advantage of. So it's not like we're going to have to deploy a microgrid just for here. We already have those relationships. So it's a little bit easier to be able to test this quite quickly with real estate development, like actually getting land and getting all those different projects, uh, like getting a project together, it can take some time. So it was very much opportunistic of we are working there, so we're doing this there. Um, but yeah, it does come with a lot of different challenges. Again, with the parking structure, that's for high density parking, right? You're not necessarily needing to have this in a suburban <coughs> London where there's a ton of parking. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting, like the tagline that we kind of use for the marketing is that you live in a park, not a parking lot. You're not necessarily, like you're in suburbia technically around you, but you're not walking, like you're not walking up to your home and seeing this massive white garage in front of you and you actually have some community aspects that you wouldn't necessarily see in what you consider to be suburbia. So it does offer some opportunities that way, but it is challenging because there are, like economically, you're not having that high land cost that you're saving on, so we can't claim that. But the other aspect of this is that we're really trying to, not necessarily this being like a one-off development, but hopefully we're working across North America on developments. We're in Monterey, Mexico. We're in um, Denver, Colorado, and around Ontario. So we're hoping to deploy this in urban areas. And the parking uh, structure itself, we're, we are, like our vision is to be able to develop that in urban areas, uh, like and being able to service uh, Lyft cars or Uber cars or like, and be able to help with EV penetration because in all of our market research, biggest complaint, oh, range of anxiety, oh, like there's not enough uh, charging, which is valid to some extent. Um, I think that there's also some forces that get going against electric vehicles as well that they're having to overcome from uh, big industry players. But there are some valid concerns there that we're gonna have to address. Um, and then the first question you were asking, uh, mentioning about the parking, uh, sorry, when people are actually leaving. And that's one of the things that we've definitely been worried about. And actually, why we'll probably have more cars than actually we would normally need, because we want a service for them for that kind of work day, which is unfortunate. And that's why matching it with potentially a ride sharing company that if they're all going to like a similar destination, could they be used during the day by a ride sharing company? That's one of the things we're trying to find other ways to be able to use those cars because you're right, people tend to leave around the same time. Logistics-wise, the carousels work fairly fast, and we'll probably, have, that's why logistics-wise, the actual scheduling of when the cars come out, so maybe at 8.15, like four, like one car comes out, even though somebody's not gonna need it for another 10 minutes, it's already out and being able to be scheduled so that you have some ability. Optimization um, should take place. Exactly, there. but we'll see if it works day one. I think it's interesting because that can create a lot of community in a sense, which is an aspect of this that you were focusing on. Because if people are going to the same place or they're going to the same locale and the car can take them in, and they live in it, they, they sort of creates a sense of community that they ride together. So the sharing aspect, I think, as 
amazing potential. Yeah, and, and, it's, and, and in terms of like, like I, I come from an Eastern Bloc country, and they used to build apartment buildings for all their workers. So all the workers lived in one building, and they all went to work together, and they all went home together, and it fostered a real sense of community that was sort of our system doesn't really have. That's what we're hoping. And like. One of the simple things is like in a lot of suburban areas, you kind of drive into your garage and then you close your garage. You don't really need to see your neighbors. If you're having to interact, with, like they call them collision points, a lot, like the architects that we're working with, which is true. Like essentially, you're able to interact with your neighbors in a different way. And I mean, we're gonna have other elements to foster community, but this transportation aspect really can make a big difference because it's such a huge component of your living situation. So. One of the things that we've come across, which we didn't necessarily think of beforehand, but it really does introduce a different type of lifestyle. Um, so, like, we've talked about, oh, this is kind of like an eat lifestyle, but truly there's a lot of different elements there. But it's also a challenge for us because we need to make sure that we do it right, because this is, you're affecting so many different aspects of people's lives. It's not just their homes, it's how they get around, which is so tied to independence and freedom, like all the different things that you really value. And so, it's a, it's a challenge, we're excited about it, um, but it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes? So, uh, uh, I was wondering, that, do you think that using, for instance, wireless charging, which is 50% less effective than parking charging, and also, for instance, those tower parking, which needs a huge amount of energy to rotate them because of that heavy weight? Yeah. Do you think it's more sustainable or not? Um, with the wireless charging, the interesting thing about it is like for autonomous vehicles, you don't want to have somebody actually manually plugging them in. So the wireless charging is an interesting ability for that. The company we've been working with claims that their efficiencies are quite higher. They're a lot higher because of they're using a magnetic resonance technology rather than using um, induct traditional inductor charging. Like Plugless, I think, was one of the big companies that's been doing it. I don't know if they're still in business or not. Um, but so they were saying like 80%, of, like 90% efficiency. So we'll have, we haven't tested it yet, so I can't like um, claim anything. Um, but uh, for the towers themselves, it's actually pretty interesting. They're pretty simple structures. They're just like a motor and a chain, essentially. Like it's not a very, um, very uh, energy intensive. I think that they're power rated like seven kilowatts or something like that. So they're not actually using that much electricity. And they're, that, that we're just gonna be putting up with maybe a couple more solar panels than we normally would to service that. So because all these are going to be electric powered and we're going to be having renewable generation on site, um, hopefully that would overcome it. But yeah, I mean, ultimately you want to be able to have the most efficient systems there. Um, and we think that by reducing, well, it, there's other elements of sustainability rather than just like the pure energy <coughs> consumption. So by reducing land occupation, like for parking, you can be able to potentially have like park area or something like that. So by having that tower, you're actually say, adding more value sustainability-wise. But I mean, technically, you are using more electricity than you normally would. But um, it'd be interesting to do like a life cycle analysis to compare like the energy, uh, the consumption that would happen from like just having a plain surface lot parking spot versus one of those. Um, but there are trade-offs, I guess. I could think. And hopefully. Not only with this system will have the parking towers, but elsewhere it can make a better environmental impact. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so it's already one. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and for joining me.